Hello, I'm Dan Cobley. I'm currently a fintech entrepreneur and founder of multiple successful tech businesses. And I was previously head of Google UK and Ireland where I spent nearly a decade. I've been doing paid keynotes, panels and speeches for more than 10 years, including the IOD annual convention at the Albert Hall, the Association of Mexican Bankers, Telecom Malaysia's Leap Summit, Money 2020, FT Live, and of course the world famous TED conference. Now, like many speakers, I'm having to move to remote speeches. I've invested in a professional setup with dedicated iMac computer, reliable super fast broadband and 4G backup, and all the lighting and kit to ensure that everything just looks and sounds really good. This home setup ensures high quality production values without the usual distractions. For live events, I can incorporate audience interaction with uh, polling stuff like Slido, or answering audience questions submitted by text or voice. I can also do tailored pre-recorded speeches, editing the video before uploading, therefore eliminating any technology or connectivity risk. And to illustrate that, I produced the video you're watching right now myself. In terms of content, the subjects I've been engaging audiences with for years are still very relevant. The COVID lockdown has accelerated digital adoption by five or 10 years in just three months. And so all manner of digital disruption and technology subjects are more relevant now than ever. And organisations that want to come out of lockdown and grow will absolutely need to embrace digital, data, machine learning and an innovation culture in order to succeed. It's worth noting that every keynote I do is tailored to the specific client brief and to the situation and goals of the industry or company I'm speaking to. So no two talks are ever the same. For events looking for a more COVID-19 specific theme, here are three possible examples. One, getting ready for the rebound, creating a culture that responds to seismic change. The winners of the past 25 years have been driven by technology and by digital. And the current lockdown has driven a massive and immediate change in digital adoption, in digital ways of working and in customer expectations. This presents huge opportunities for organisations that can respond to the change more quickly and an existential threat to those that cannot. But as we all know, adapting to change is really hard. I spent the dot-com crash in Silicon Valley, the financial crisis leading Google UK and the past six years building some of Europe's top fintech startups. Drawing on this experience, I talk about the changes that the current crisis is driving, what's likely to stick and how companies can develop a culture that is more flexible and nimble. More than ever, it is the organisations that are most responsive to change that will survive and thrive. Two, marketing in the new normal or engaging with customers in an appropriate post-COVID way. The developed world has essentially moved fully online in the first half of 2020. Every grandparent has been taught how to chat with their grandkids, uh, online using Zoom or whatever, and how to get essential supplies delivered to home. E-commerce rates have skyrocketed and people's willingness to engage and trust digitally is like never before. This creates new challenges and opportunities for businesses which are exposed in a speech full of practical, actionable tips and advice. And three, for companies that are looking for something to continue training and upskilling their people while they're working from home or indeed when they first get back to the office, I offer a video workshop on Pretotyping, a vital toolkit for validating ideas for new products or services quickly, objectively and accurately. With the seismic shift in consumer attitudes and preferences that will clearly follow the current pandemic, we'll all have to reassess our offerings. Pretotyping is a smart approach developed by Google to evaluating genuine customer responses to a new proposition before investing heavily in its development. In an interactive workshop, yes, you can be interactive over video, I will help teams to understand the power of this approach and how to adopt it in their everyday business lives. I will leave the teams with a reduced fear of failure and an ability to iterate on ideas more quickly and more cheaply. Hello, this is Dan Cobley. I'm sharing here a small section from a recent 45 minute presentation I gave to a large pharmaceutical client 
on how do you engender the entrepreneurial spirit within a large organization. Hope you enjoy. Next, uh, use data and kill the hippo. So the great thing about the digital world we live in today is you can almost always develop a reasonably quick, efficient, low cost way to gather data to inform decisions that you might need to make. And a very famous example from the tech world is uh, from about 2004 when Google had launched Gmail and was obviously running search. You might remember that on the search results page, you had the organic results on the left and down the right hand side, you had 10 essentially blue text links that were underlined and clicked away to the advertiser's site. When Gmail was launched, it also had a blue link to uh, click to advertisers, but the designer there made a mistake and they chose a slightly different shade of blue. Now in a typical organization, you would have some senior person make a decision. They would choose which was the right blue and that would be the answer. In a data-driven organization, you uh, find a way to create an experiment to inform a decision. And in this case, what Google did is that they ran a series of 1% experimental tests on the Google homepage so that they would feed to uh, a randomly selected 1% of the uh, Google audience a certain shade of blue. Another 1% would get a different blue. And they did this not just for the two blues, but for 42 different possible shades of blue. And they learned from that that people preferred, and by extension clicked more on, a blue that was a slightly more purple shade versus the greener shades of some of the others. And as a result, they picked a new shade of blue different to either the first two to be the link to the advertiser sites. Now you might say, gee whiz, that's a lot of work for a very tiny choice. But given that Google's revenue comes from those clicks, that new blue shade informed by this data-driven experiment generated an additional $200 million of annualized revenue back in 2004. An extraordinary result and much better than the result you could likely have got from asking somebody like the marketing director what they would have done. Uh, obviously, that was my job at one point. So, uh, you know, always looking for data rather than those kind of uh, ill-informed decisions. And then that comes to this, kill the hippo. We all know that uh, if you go on safari, they warn you that the most uh, dangerous animal uh, on the safari is the hippo, uh, kills more humans than the other animals, but it's also the most dangerous animal in the corporate boardroom because the hippo is the highest paid person's opinion. And in the absence of data to help you to make a decision, typically you will turn to the most senior person in the room and she or he will be asked to opine on what the answer is. And if it's a big question of strategy or long-term vision or whatever, that's absolutely appropriate. But if it's a question of what shade of blue to pick, then they are typically furthest away from the detail of the product or the customer and likely to make a poorly informed decision. So the best way to tame the hippo is to make sure that you have data and you have a culture of looking for answers from data in your organization to make sure that you can continue to innovate and challenge and move forward. But one of the challenges we all face is that in many cases, there's just too much data and people are drowned in uh, spreadsheets and databases of numbers that it's difficult to get any real meaning from. So uh, what's really important is to make sure that you make data visual. And I think this is very nicely illustrated by this experiment where a uh, data scientist um, did a trawl of the dark web where he found about 4.3 million uh, hacked and, uh, and posted four-digit passwords that came from all different sources, from uh, people's mobile phone unlocks, from their um, uh, answer machines, uh, from their router passwords, and so on. Um, got those passwords and analyzed them for frequency. And if you do a traditional frequency analysis, you'll get something like this. I mean, first of all, it's actually quite insightful. It tells us that uh, nearly 11% of people are using 1234 as their password which is absolutely crazy. Um, so easy to, to guess or hack. Um, and then you go down the list, you know, the top uh, 10 will get you nearly 30% of, uh, of passwords will be uh, easily hackable by somebody who knows this, this frequency list. 
but you can learn so much more than the fact that people are a bit lazy and stupid by going to a visual representation of this data. And this was done by a fabulous data scientist who shared this chart. What this is is an XY plot on the uh, X axis on the bottom, you've got the first two digits and on the Y axis up the side, you've got the second two digits. So uh, something like 75, 25 would be three quarters of the way along the bottom and a quarter of the way up the side. Okay, I think you've got the idea. And then the colors on them, the brighter the yellow, the closer to uh, bright yellow or white is the highest frequency and the darker is the, uh, the numbers that are very rarely used. So what can we learn from this that we couldn't learn easily by looking at the table on the previous page? Well, if you look at the area marked one, that shows that while some people who choose one, two, three, four are incredibly lazy and stupid, a lot of people are just a bit lazy and stupid in that they choose a repeating double digit number, uh, 25, 25, 63, 63, uh, or whatever. So that's what that line tells you. Line two tells us when people were born. So that's 19 and then numbers up the, uh, up the vertical. So people are essentially using their date of birth. Now date of birth that you can work out plus or minus a year from LinkedIn for most people uh, is an incredibly insecure number. Um, and you can also see from the brightness there some other curious things that um, you know, the people, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of darker area towards the top because people are a bit too young perhaps to have engaged very much in passwords and don't have uh, pin cards and so on. Um, and down at the bottom there are very few because most of those people sadly are dead uh, and no longer um, uh, running their passworded devices. And then the area three you can see there, uh, it's American format. I'm sure you've all guessed this by now, but that's your date of birth in month and day. So who would have thought that from hacked passwords on the dark web, you could tell with real certainty that there are only 28 days in February. Uh, quite extraordinary and also an illustration of people's laziness and stupidity because there are many places online, Facebook, whatever, that you can get somebody's date of birth and therefore hack their password. So if you've learned nothing at all from today's presentation apart from one thing, then hopefully it's this. Uh, go home and uh, check and probably change the passwords on your uh, home router, answer machine, things like that. Hi, this is Dan Cobley, and this is a short section from a recent presentation given to a group of international financial services and banker types talking about the extraordinary threat that is coming from the innovation-led fintech players, how it is destroying their business and how they absolutely have to act now in order to remain relevant to their customers today. Thank you. Having talked about the S-curves of digital and technology-led transformation, let's look at the transformation that's going in in financial services through the lens of overseas currency transfers and a UK business called TransferWise, who incidentally are due to launch here pretty soon. Founded in 2011 in London by a couple of Estonian young men who were fed up with paying too much to send their money home, they hated the non-transparent ways in which banks and money transfer services charged for what they did. And they realized that a new technology uh, approach could make the process cheaper and much easier. So they launched in April 2012 with initially a pretty clunky website, but with a very fair mid-market FX rate and a low transparent fee. Initially, most people thought it was crazy. Why would you trust sending your money with a startup you'd never heard of run by a couple of Estonian kids? And predictably, in 2012, the transfer volumes were less than $10 million. Revenue was pretty negligible, and of course, the banks ignored them. With lots of work and with positive reviews, uh, good press and happy customers, trust levels improved. New country-to-country -country corridors were added, and their clunky website was replaced by a slick site and mobile app. Volume started to get meaningful. In 2016, TransferWise had a million customers, did $12 billion in total volume, and had stolen over 10% of the UK outbound consumer transfers market. Customers of the big banks 
were starting to use TransferWise for the money transfer task, and that was stealing revenue away from their banks. But the banks didn't know how to react, as doing so would have been to cannibalise their own highly profitable revenues. Forward to 2018, and buoyed by further growth, TransferWise was starting to partner with banks, offering their service as an embedded function within the, ba within the bank's own proposition. Through a partnership with Monzo, launched in June 2018, they were able to offer transfers that were 2% cheaper than the next cheapest bank. They also partnered with Bunk in the Netherlands, uh, Zero for SME transfers, and with uh, BCPE, the number two bank in France, with over 40 million customers. This year, TransferWise will do $100 billion worth of international money transfer. This has ripped over $3 billion in fees revenue from the competition, and more importantly, it's now a lever to rip whole customer relationships away from them. People who really value TransferWise will be tempted to move their banking relationship from an incumbent to a TransferWise partner. Monzo now has over 3 million customers in the UK. Its growth is accelerating and it's accelerated further since the TransferWise integration. And of course, the growth of TransferWise is following our familiar S-curve of evolution. Using this kind of fintech service is no longer seen as crazy. It's now pretty exciting and it's soon to be the normal or mainstream activity. Thank you for listening and watching. You can find out a lot more about my speaking, including subjects I speak about, videos, photos and client testimonials at www.dancobley.com.